Jenny Greenstein, my own personal stylist who has totally changed my life. I, I will tell you, I did not know how important clothing could be. I actually really just like ignored that fact for at least two years mm -hmm. until you came into my life and I thank you so much. Um, I fell in love with Jenny over Instagram. <laughs> our daughters, our second daughters, um, have the same name, Paz and Bloom Paz. Mm -hmm. It's pretty special. Yeah. And we knew we were bashert. We were like meant to be months and months before we ever met. Um, she's the founder of Your Soul Style, which is um, a styling uh, firm. Would that would we call it? Yeah, a consultant. You know, consulting. Um, right now, it's me. Um, you know, one on one. And hopefully the plan is to expand. So Amazing. perhaps more stylists that work yeah. at Your Soul Style. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I also, by the way, Laura, um, she's also Dan's stylist because I got him on board. Which I love is that. Very exciting. It's a whole. She did a whole. Men need a lot of help. Rabani. Really <laughs> <laughs> she did a Rabani circuit and revamp. Yes. It's really changed things. Yes, I'm going you. for, um, with Brian, I'm going for like a Gucci, House of Gucci-esque yeah. vibe. Uh, so nice, we'll, nice. we'll see how where that lands. I'm very excited. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, so I wanted to have you on, well, just because you're just so, you're inspiring. I remember this one um, story of yours on Instagram. It, you had taken over the New York family mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. And you were like, you know, I think you were nine months pregnant. Probably. At the time. I think I remember. Really yeah. Yeah. like. With Bloom. With Bloom. Mm -hmm. And you were hustling like, I think it, you, maybe you had two clients in a day. It felt like a lot. But like the passion you bring to your work, it is so inspiring. And um, I think. It really spoke to me in a way that I never thought of, like clothing and personal um, expression would. Like mm -hmm. I, I didn't know it was that important. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love to hear you talk more about your inspiration when it comes to, especially now after this pandemic, your own pregnancy, your postpartum experience, how style has sort of evolved mm -hmm. over over this time for you mm -hmm. and how you see it in your clients. Yeah. You know, your soul style is all about the integration of style and mindfulness. And prior to my first pregnancy, I, you know, that was my philosophy. That's always been my philosophy, style from the inside out and being empowered by your own authenticity and having that come through the medium of style. Mm. So I think that we're all going through transformations our whole lives. You know, it's not, we don't, we're not born and we're the same person. We continue to reiterate with all of the influences and the experiences that impact our lives and our becoming and who we are. And having a baby, I think for me, and I can't speak for everybody, but probably was one of the most profound transformations of my life. Mm. So, you know, like I said, I launched Your Soul Style in 2013 and I, um, Vita was born in 2015. Oh, wow. So it was only a couple of years before I became pregnant. And what I realized immediately was how challenging getting dressed is while you're <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> and I had never experienced that before. And it, I mean, I've experienced challenge, challenges with personal style in other moments in my life, but not such a huge physical transformation and of course emotional as well. So, you know, I thought to myself, me, someone who's a personal stylist is having so many challenges with getting dressed. Yeah. I can't imagine how your average woman who doesn't necessarily have personal style in the forefront of their mind all the time, they, it must be a struggle. And yeah, so I started to really do my own homework on myself mm. and really, you know, figure out what that means in terms of um, how I was going to dress in this changing shape and this changing person. And 
that was through my pregnancy, which was it had its own set of challenges. But I think, interestingly enough, postpartum was even more tricky. Oh, really? So even though, you know, your body is, you know, contracting, <laughs> or so to speak, um, the emotional shift that happens after you have a baby and that yeah. tr- profound transformation that happens from, you know, physical standpoint, uh, financial, mm. emotional, mental, you know, time, you know, disposable time. Mm. I didn't know what to do. And I felt like a different person, really. You know? I think you probably were right. They say that when a baby is born, a mother yeah. is born. It's like a rebirth, right? Mm-hmm. It's like a rebirth of yourself. So from, and then I was breastfeeding. So layering that on top of it and just how I physically felt and then, you know, just how exhausted I was, I, I could not figure out how to show up. Because I didn't want to put on the clothing that I wore while I was pregnant because I wasn't pregnant, you know, and there's that like whole stigma around like, you know, I don't want to be wearing my maternity jeans. I'm not pregnant. Yeah. Or like um, bouncing back. Well, yeah, that's like Meanwhile, a Meanwhile, you're like, <laughs> like light years ahead on a soul level, you know? Oh my like, God, completely. The idea of going backwards, oh, this weird, this weird expectation that we would ever look the same. Right. When... We are not the same right. anymore. And and also, like, if you think about it, like, in what, like, when do you ever want to go backwards, really, in anything? I mean, the, the only time we ever want to go backwards is when we want to lose weight. Oh, I remember in high school I did that. Or, oh, my wedding dress. and uh, That's the literal only time I would ever refer to a time before. Even, like, I got on a, the phone with, like, a nutritionist, and she was like, Okay, so when was the last time backwards mm-hmm. you felt mm-hmm. like you had a real handle on your body image and blah, blah, blah. And like, that's the only time I've ever considered moving backwards. Mm-hmm. And why? Yeah, I well, mean, that's like a very cultural too, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what like the language is in media, bouncing back um, on the cover of magazines you know, this person bounced back. Yeah. And you know what? There are unicorns out there that actually do bounce back. I met one last night, by the way. Um, and they exist. <laughs> just, I promise you they exist. She's so nice. She's so nice. I'm so fit. Um, Seven weeks out. Yeah, that was not me. No, not me at either. all. Nope, nope. Um, if we're like, you know, using the like the baseline of like what your pre-pregnancy weight was to, to you know, to, to um, look at, to achieve or to like want to like achieve or get get back to, um, I, it probably took me three years, I'm going to reframe it, to find myself in a place where I felt good about my body again. Mm. And it was a different body. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. it took me three years because I also was an extended breastfeeding mom. So it's a myth <laughs> that breastfeeding <laughs> helps you to lose weight because it's not true for all women. That's right. And that, I think, is a myth as well. Yeah. Um, that when we're like, I'm going to breastfeed and I'm gonna, the pounds are going to just like fall off. And that is not the case for many, many, many women. Plus, like whether it does or it doesn't, your body is not completely your own during that time. Right. So, you know, how you feel in your body. I felt empowered by breastfeeding. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, you loved it, right? That was Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the sense also, I got. Yeah, no, no. I absolutely loved it. Um, but my body, I didn't really feel like I could completely reclaim my body until I was done. My question is, did did this body um, stuff, did it predate pregnancy for you? Like, was this like a conversation before, you, you know, before your body changed? Like, or was it a new experience to, to not feel totally in in your body mm-hmm. and accepting of your body you yeah know. i mean i think that's been an evolving process yeah for me i'm 42 i still think i have work to do in that area i think Ditto. there's so many influences that impact how we feel about our bodies and our vehicles and it comes from you know f- family you know history it comes from the way you were parented yeah. it comes from media and cultural influences, your peers. I mean, there's so much, right? And I think that if you're of my age, right, I think that there are majority of women have some sort of challenge with feeling whole and complete within their body. Yeah. Um, 
And I hope having two young daughters, right? Now I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old yeah. who are hopefully not thinking about their body at all in that way. Which Do they, I, they don't make any reference no, to it. No, yeah, no, 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 yeah, no. But I, I mean, mean, I don't know every single thing they're always thinking, but yeah. I'm just going to assume no. Yeah, you would probably um, pick up I'm on I'm so hyper-conscious of the language that so, – like, I'm not feeling like – even when I don't feel completely empowered in my skin or if I'm having an off day or, you know, I'm like feeling whatever it is, not in the body that I want to be at the moment. Yeah. Um, that is information that doesn't leave my lips in the presence of my daughters. Mm. Um, I am extremely conscious of that. So that's my own journey. That's my own personal growth work. Mm. Um, but I don't want to... Um, pass that on to them. They will have their own influences that are outside of my power, but what I can control, um, I will. Yeah. I mean, I found that in your in your um, care, you were very empowering of whatever I looked like and also very accepting of whatever I felt like in the clothes that I was trying on, which I really appreciated, which is not always the case, I don't think, with stylists because often it can be about what it just looks like on the outside, but styling from the inside mm -hmm. out, you know, it's it's definitely changed the way I operate in the world. Mm -hmm. For it's, sure, it's a really big reframe for yourself. You know, it's it's a really it's a shift in perspective. It's kind of um, tweaking your lens on how you see yourself because if we look around us and the expectation is that we're supposed to look like that, mm -hmm. then you're always going to be up against something that is is you're swimming upstream. Well, because I'm not that. I'm this. Because you're this. And this is beautiful. So how do I look at this and, you know, really see myself? Yeah. Um, and that's not, that's you. That's every, That's many, many women that I work with. Yeah. Um, it's really about understanding your own personal sense of style, your own sense of being, your own shape, um, and really getting behind it and really being empowered by it. Yeah. And the noise and the distractions and the chaos that's coming into our minds all the time. It's like, how do we um, build the tools to, um, you know, diminish that yeah. so that we can see clearly who we are when we move that aside? So part of who you are is like what you call a New York family. Is that right? Mm -hmm. At least that's what you've written before. What does that mean to you? A New York family? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, Are you from New York? I, I'm from Long Island. Ah. I'm not from, I grew up in Manhattan. Um, well, I think we're a New York family in the sense that we are a same-sex um, couple. Yeah. So, you know, there are obviously lots of different places in the world where um, there are pockets of um, same-sex couples and families like more predominant you know more have more of a presence i should say but new york is definitely a melting pot and yeah. very diverse so i feel very connected and rooted here because i feel like my family is one it's very normal and i use that like air quotes like normal um in this environment yeah uh, and that feels really good i mean when we travel, like whether it be like before I had kids or now when we do, we're very aware of where we are and the dynamics of our family and mm -hmm. how that's received. Mm -hmm. We went to India on our honeymoon and I loved it. I mean, India is like the most beautiful country, but, you know, it's different being in a country like India in a same sex relationship and being in New York City. Yeah. Um, culturally speaking. Yeah. And... When we go to a place like the Caribbean or, you know, wherever we're vacationing, so to speak, it's not New York <laughs> and it, it's yeah. got a different vibe. And when I come back and I land and we like go through the Midtown Tunnel. Oh my gosh, I love that that drive. You know that drive? <laughs> when, when you're like, you've gone, yes. you've gone somewhere. You're like, like amazing. <laughs> I know, but like, it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter if you're like flying from Chicago or from like Rome, you know, like that drive. Yeah. That drive is so portal. beautiful. I mean, also very ugly. <laughs> it's like yeah. very like, yeah. it sort of reminds me of pregnancy and like, and motherhood in general. It's like, there's this like, that drive is such a portal. It's like right. That's ugly word. and grimy. And there is something otherworldly ecstatic about it. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Home. It, it feels like home and yeah. it feels calming for me. Yeah. Um, 
there's a certain sense of acceptance being in New York yeah. in, in my family dynamic. Well, you know, like I, I hope that for the mom curious crowd that we can offer a village where we are this place where different families of all kinds can be represented. Yeah. And, and that if a person is wondering like, how does she do it that we have Jenny here? And she's like, no, you could do, you know, like I am your expander in this way. We, we as mothers and as like elders, I think of this like village, Mm -hmm. we can be the sort of the lights, like you can do this. Yeah. You can be this. You have two beautiful daughters. Mm-hmm. All four of you have such great style. <laughs> Thank you. Does Thank Dina, you. Do, you. Do you style Dina? I do not. Because I saw them <laughs> walking through the Bronx Zoo. This was the first time I ever saw their family. I, this is the first time I ever saw you like ever in person. I actually. know. It was like. I didn't recognize you. I mean, you have <laughs> great the style. Last one You're you fantastic. Recognized. Don't get me wrong. But it was Dina that I recognized. <laughs> Because she has such great style. She's got her own thing going on. She's got her own yeah, thing for sure. going on. Those yeah. glasses. Where are those glasses from? Always glasses. That's her thing. Yeah. That's her accessory of choice. Is it? Glasses and sneakers and are, hats probably. Are they like real or are they like, are they prescription? Or are they yeah, no, no, they are. Oh, they are. Okay. They are. Yeah. Um, how did you guys meet? We met at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> like, so romantic. Yeah. In New York City. In New York City, in the East Village. And yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I the second I saw her, I I felt like it was like, that's it, like game over. <laughs> like I swear, <laughs> I really did. And yeah, that was that was it pretty much. I oh. mean, we, we hung out, we got to know each other, so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah. How long ago was that? That was in two thousand eight. What is so that so <laughs> that thirteen was terrible years ago. Math. How long? So it's nearly nearly 14 years ago. Yeah, it's been a yeah, it's in 2022 it'll be our 10 year wedding anniversary. Dan and I just celebrated insane. 10 years. Congratulations to you. Yeah, to you too. Are Ten. you going to do anything fun? I would like to go to Copenhagen. So as Copenhagen, shade. okay, great. <laughs> um that's on our list, so that's if all is, you know, calm in the world and we can make that happen and have child care. Because that's always a thing. You got to plan it out um, now, don't yeah, you? Yeah. Actually, Laura had this great question because we saw that you just recently took your first two days away from Vita and Bloom. Mm-hmm. It's yes to get like both of them. Maybe ever? Yeah. We, I've been away from Vita. Um, I had to be away from both of them because I had a family emergency this summer, but not like in, within like intention, intentionally yeah, um, yeah. time away from both of them. And also with Dina. Oh, yes. And with Dina because well, I had gone the, to that was by the myself. Part- <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, was with, I, was, I was away from them with, by myself though. My wife was taking care of them. Yeah, but you guys had like a romantic getaway in your yes, own home. In our own. We, took a, we had a staycation in our house. How was that? It was amazing. It was really great. Um, the reason why you noted it, Laura, was because that's a long time for you, two years, huh? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, so our our group, the Mom Curious group, they have certain concerns, you know, about <laughs> about personal time, <laughs> personal time, travel. How do you fit it in? How mm-hmm. do you, you know? So I just thought that that was like a yeah. very interesting. Now I know it was the pandemic, so that yeah. skews things a little bit sure. time wise too. But yeah, it no. really put a wrench in things. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Really put her in things. Yeah. Really did. Probably right after we had our second babies too. Yeah, they were like six months old. Yeah. Um, but do you usually get away? No. No. <laughs> um, but I will say that I work with so many moms, right? So I, I meet women all the time who have ki- who have kids, and it ranges. So I don't think that having children is a recipe for. It's not like a direct line to like you don't have any more personal time or there's no flexibility to travel. But A, it obviously takes a lot of extra effort um, and planning. And money. Money, of course, 100%. But I think that for me, a big reason that I was so tethered was because I was an extended breastfeeding mom. And that was personal choice. So like, So like I have lots of clients who – even if they breastfed for like a little while or not at all, um, didn't have that tether and were able to resume like a different, but you know, similar lifestyle as they did 
pre-kids mm. um, as far as taking trips and traveling with their partners. And some of my clients, you know, it's so vital to their relationship yeah. that they just set the expectation from the jump yeah. that, you know, maybe not obviously like when the baby's like first born, but, you know, three months later, four months later, if you plan for it, it's very, it's very doable. I think it depends on the woman, you know, like how um, it, it, I think it's a personal choice. You know, for me, I had a lot of hard, I had a hard time separating. So it was like, me too. <laughs> it was very intense for me. Like I, I, like I physically like couldn't do it, you know. I but I'm not. Really a, I'm, do know. And a lot of women, I know a lot of women share that. And a lot of women do but a not. Lot of women and don't. God bless them. Thank God they exist. Yeah. Like as a permission slip to the other women yeah. who don't experience that, who yeah. don't need to. They yeah. don't need to be sticking around out of obligation. They really yeah. don't. The great thing about being a mother is that you can do it your own way. Yeah. Right. Like there, like we were just talking about. Like there, literally is no script. You're like freestyling like, through the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> and you just need to um, learn what works for you through trial and error, error through figuring yeah. out what are you know non-negotiables for you for your relationship. Um, yeah, it's really you can just craft it however however suits you and your family. And there's no there's really no right or wrong way to yeah. do it. That's such a beautiful way to put it. And it actually brings me, it's like a very nice segue into something that we've been like get, liking to get into on this on these talks are how you got pregnant. What was that experience like? And mm -hmm. I think particularly for you being in a same-sex couple, mm -hmm. that's like worthy information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that's something you're cool getting into, that would be amazing. Yeah, definitely comfortable with talking about um, – the process, like, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable talking about, like, where we, like, you know, oh, like, how, you know, like, sort yeah. of, like, the genetic no, contributors. No, 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 no. Wh no. Whatever, whatever's, like, of service. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, I just, um, did you always want to be a mom? Not, I like, wasn't, uh, like, a little girl who was always, like, I can't wait to be a mom. Like, I wasn't, like, I wasn't. that at all. Oh. And even, I mean, even, like, in my 20s, um, when I was like exploring my sexuality, I didn't really think about it too much because I wasn't really sure what like path of my life would go. Yeah. So I wasn't really sure or I had, hadn't explored like what the options were if I wasn't going to be married to a man or with a man to have a child. Um, what are my options? And there yeah. are a lot of options and it doesn't necessarily mean like your options are like, you know, heterosexual versus homosexual relationship, there are women who decide to have children on their own yeah. who are just totally passionate about yeah. motherhood and they're just like, I'm just going to do this on my, by myself. And I, I actually know two or three women who have, and I think they're amazing. Me I feel- too. I want to get them on I'm also. very inspired by women that decide Me to too. do that because it's hard. And a woman and who- worthy. And worthy. And a woman who decides to do that really, really wants it, you know? Yes, really, really do. wants it. Um, the harder it is to bring a child into this world, it's like the the person who's doing it wants it that bad, you yeah. know, because it's really hard. Yeah, you talk to IVF moms mm -hmm. and you're like, they're just like so happy they're yeah. here. Oh, yeah. There's I mean, as happy as I am, I mean, yeah, thank course. God I didn't have any trouble, but... And, like, my son's name literally means miracle, you know, like, yeah. I'm big into them. Yeah. But really, the harder it is, like, oh, yeah. the more delicious they're... Yeah manifestation i think like i both of my kids were ivf oh okay yeah yeah so um in terms of ivf uh you know you obviously have to like harvest the eggs and then you have sperm and then you create embryo and the embryo gets you know transferred and hopefully it implants into the uterus and then you have a baby obviously i've just totally simplified it and it's way more complicated than that but that's you know that's those are the steps i mean that's information to, to me yeah you know and i and if you if you've been a mom for like nearly five <laughs> years, you know, if not everyone shares that. So I appreciate it. Yeah. And if you're fortunate enough to have more than one embryo, you know, if you have a lot. Like or, you could have like had twins? Well, no, if you the oh, once the em the embryos are created outside mm -hmm. of a woman's body and either they're freshly transferred over into a woman's uterus or they're frozen. Um, mm -hmm. and you wait to do the transfer. Mm -hmm. So in my case, they were frozen. And I was fortunate that I had, it could have been somewhere around like 10 or 11 healthy embryos, which is 
kind of it's we're very fortunate you know very fortunate and um so like Vito, if you wanted 10 or 11 children you could have <laughs> like, yeah, like a whole like basketball team <laughs> let's yes. do this they're yeah. very cute and they have an excellent style the most <laughs> stylish basketball team of all time i would imagine <laughs> They ask, you know, the fertility doctor will ask if you want one or two embryos transferred. I think in the case of women who have fertility challenges, um, they're, and these are all, again, these are all personal choices. The decision might be to do two in the hopes that like one out of the two would implant. I didn't like technically have fertility challenges. Right. I was in a same sex relationship. So it's, right. it's a little bit different. Just, you know, I just want to be like, keep that like, on the table, you know, as so that I understand it's yeah. not exactly the same. Yeah. Um, but so if you're fortunate enough to have more than one healthy embryo, I only decided to have one transferred with with Vita. And Vita did not Vita was the my second Vita was conceived on my second round of IVF. Yeah. So the first round of IVF for me did not work. Mm-hmm. Then Which is normal, right? Yeah, of course. I mean it's Again, like some women only wind up with one healthy embryo to transfer. Right. So, so there's like a lot more pressure. Like, yeah, there's a lot more pressure there. Um, and you, you want it to work. You know, I didn't go straight to IVF. I did something called IUI, which yeah. is intrauterine insemination, four times before I went to IVF and they all didn't work. Because it's uh, a little more invasive, IVF? IVF is a lot more invasive. Okay. Like a lot more. Um, but it's like more precise. Right, right. Like the chances are higher that you're yes. gonna get pregnant. Yes. Okay. Um, it's less for your body to do on its own because so much is the work is done for you by okay. science. Thanks, science. <laughs> Which, thank you, Western thank medicine. Thank you so much. <laughs> um. Can, so yeah. Can you speak to a little bit about the shots? The shot. Ah, because yeah. this is something that I know. Like I have personal questions about that mm-hmm. I know others are like mm-hmm. because you know I've had a shot. I've had, you know, and you think like, sure, a shot, I'm good. Sure. But like even my closest friends that are going through IVF are like, yeah. it is fucking rigorous. This yeah, is no, saying. no, no. It's not like getting like a vaccine. Because you're doing it yourself, right? You're doing it every day too. And you have to do progesterone shots like for like, I did them for 12 weeks after I was pregnant. After. Which was a nightmare actually. It was like the worst because part of it. 12 weeks, that's when you're super nauseous and there's implanting. I was, I had like, um... Peri, like perinatal depression so oh, I was mommy. I had like a really really hard first trimester with bloom not with Vita I didn't really know that. dark dark days my I'm first sorry. trimester I don't know how much of it was like influenced by all of the hormones that I was taking to conceive bloom I'm sure it didn't life help. Ha- being a second time parent you know, like, there was like so much going on it's actually so much to be pregnant the second time around yeah it's um, there's intense. like a lot of mourning that happens for at least yeah. in my experience a lot of mourning that happens around your time with your first child i mean that is like the romance of the century yes your first baby yes oh, i could just like there's no first baby there's, no, there's, there's I, only I, one first I, baby i love i love Paz so much mm-hmm. um it is so different yes yeah. it is so different and like there really will never be that experience again mm-hmm. so i i i can totally relate to you can experience your first twice that's exactly right you can. <laughs> um but as far as like the, the the hormones um it's very very intense and it's mood altering and physically altering um and you have to do it regularly and it's been like a little bit of time since i've done it so i don't remember everything because what i was going to say is that with bloom my second I already had the embryos frozen. So I actually ha- didn't have to do so much of that preliminary work again. I really right. just went straight to the transfer, which still required to do hormone shots. Right. Because what you're doing is you're you're mimicking in your body with science and 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 hormones what it would do on its own had you naturally conceived, right. had, had the sperm at the egg and then it, it releases the, the progesterone and the hormones and then your uterus lining, you know, the estrogen makes your uterus really fluffy and that's when the embryo implants. But all of that has to be done and prepped with hormones so that your body, you're it, tricking your body into thinking that it really went through a conception, when it, which it didn't. It's just, you need, your body needs to be at that point when they do the transfer so that the transfer can stick. 
That's amazing. This is when Science. you're like, you have all this information. I'm a doctor. You're like a ba- you basically are a doctor. You know, like okay. also we're just like walking around with this like information. <laughs> you're just like walking around with this stuff. Like I'm so happy there's a place to put it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because so. like so many women need it. So grateful. I, I, we're all, I, we are true. I can speak for all of us. We are <laughs> truly all so grateful for you sharing this information because it is very hard to find. It's very scary to Google. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard yeah. to see yourself reflected in moms when you're not a mom yet. So well, how did you find this information? Like, how did you even know that this was the route you wanted to take? Well, after doing the like the uh, after doing the IUI four times, yeah, I could have kept I could have kept trying it that way, um, but I I was like it was so emotional to prep myself every month to do this IUI procedure every month and then have it had it and then wait like maybe two weeks each time to yeah. find out that I wasn't pregnant. It was actually like devastating. It was really, really, really hard. So to be honest with you, like for me, somebody that was doing it this way because I was in a same-sex relationship, was if it was this devastating to me, I truly can't imagine how challenging it, it is for women that have actual fertility issues and right. do this for years, really, truly years. It's, it's very intense. Very intense. I have a lot of empathy for women that go through that. And I'm sure you've worked with them, yeah? Uh, or maybe people don't share it, you know, once they have the kid already and they're already onto the stylist and moving <laughs> on with their lives. Like, maybe they're just not sharing it because it's heavy, you know? I think that, like, like what we were talking about before, there's there for me, going through it this way, I don't think that, like, I love my children more than you because you conceive them naturally. But I will say that for me, and I can't speak for you, the, the level of gratitude for the, like, the healthy pregnancy was, like, off the charts. Yeah. Because, because it, took so, it took so much work to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Like, with anything in life, not just making babies. Like, that's with anything. Like, the more you work at something, the how grateful you are when it finally comes to fruition and it this, happens. This is a theme in our conversations, which is that, like, yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it doesn't look pretty all the time. Yeah, it's a climb up the mountain. Mm-hmm. And that's part of its glory. Yeah. It's like, totally. you know, the Vedas, like, I, you know, I, I am a big meditator. Mm-hmm. And in the Vedas, they say that the whole point of this thing is for the one to become two, for the joy of becoming one again. Right? So that, like, really, there's this, like, kind of, we're, like, playing charades right now pretending you're Laura and you're Jenny and you're Daniela you know mm-hmm. like we're all one like it's a we're all just a bunch of fucking atoms just <laughs> like bopping around but the joy is that we've splintered off so that we could have this experience of oneness this experience of connectedness mm-hmm. um i feel i really felt that in my experience with being uh with with having children you know like i have I was one person. We were one. Mm-hmm. And then we've become two. And like when you when you breastfeed, mm-hmm. when you're like really in a connected moment, when you've climbed the mountain or dealt with the IVF or whatever, whatever that looks like on that day, because it happens every fucking day, mm-hmm. that the ecstasy, the the joy of coming back together is really I don't even have words for it, Mm -hmm. you know? It's magic. (laughs) It's miraculous. Yeah. You look like you have a question. I do. I have another question from the group, um, and it is style-related, which is some women are concerned that they'll lose their edge Mm. um, if they become a mother. And if you could just speak to, like, how can you still dress cool or badass or still be fuckable was, like, very (laughs) much a – a through line, like a through line con- uh, concern. I feel, s- I, I feel sexier now <laughs> as a mother and as a woman who has lived through this like huge transformative experience than I have ever felt in my entire life. Yeah. Like so much more empowered, uh, really stretched in a really beautiful way. Um, that being said, I think that there's a learning curve. And I think that when you do initially enter 
this new role, it's a practice. It's an absolute practice. You do not make this huge shift and figure it all out overnight. That is not, that's, that is, um, that, like, I don't even think that we should go into it thinking that, you know, we yeah. should go into it thinking like, I'm about to embark on one of the most transformative things that will ever happen to me. And I'm going to lean into that really hard and I'm going to be empowered by it. And I'm going to do all the work so that when I come out on the other side, I'm going to embrace it in, in a new way and really learn about this new person and this rebirth, right? Mm. This like rebirth of who I am. When it comes to personal style and getting dressed, like there is a shift. Of course, there's a shift, but you are a beautiful sexual being and that is not impacted by becoming a mother at all. I don't, I don't think. I put on a I put on this outfit and I was like, oh my hips and my thighs and she, she just looked at me and she was like, you look so good. You do. Thank you. And I, you know, it really sometimes does take another woman to like see you. You know, to see your like lusciousness gift you're giving people. Truly. Yeah. I had a client last week who I've seen who I just saw for the first time and we went through the process of consultation huge closet cleanse which was very cathartic when you like totally detox your closet and she has she has two kids as well they're a little bit older than our kids and then you know sort of layering on top of that you know building out her her wardrobe um and i was chatting with her on text a few days later and she was wearing one of the things that we had but she had bought that i had um picked for her and she was like i forgot who the fuck i was yeah yes that's yeah. what she said. She's like, I forgot who the fuck I was. She's like, there I am. I know. There I am. I'm wearing these vegan leather pants that Jenny pulled for me. And I'm like, I'm I'm a fuckable, <laughs> like, artist, mm -hmm. healer. Yes. Mama, woman that I just, like, totally forgot. Uh -huh. I totally just, like, who knew? Mm-hmm. It t sometimes takes another woman to remind you. How can you women know? remind themselves to do that? Because I think it's very easy, like hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, you've you've done your session. You've you know, but like when they're in the thick of it, mm -hmm. how can they like remind themselves? I guess like, and this is a question to both of you. How can you kind of remind yourself who you are? Mm -hmm. I, I I think that that's a process. So I, I don't think that it happens like that. Like I really do think, and and our kids are pretty much the same age. So yeah. I think we're like in this sort of like same like timeline of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, when your kids are really young, and you're in the thick of it, you're you're just in go mode. Really, you're really just like figuring it all out. You're you know when you go from one to two, then that's a huge shift, and you're managing two schedules, not one schedule. Um, and and we do our priorities do take the hit right like somebody's priorities have to take the hit our priorities do have to take the hit in some way because we have to we have to um rethink about how we are managing things and multitasking managing we don't, time we managing don't have money, as much time managing relationships so i think very organically space at the point where your kids get to be too and higher. And you'll something. notice this. And when they become, I don't want to use the word independent because two year olds are clearly not independent, but when they are a little bit more um, able to manage, you know, playing by themselves or um, walking or, or eating or not food breastfeeding. themselves or not breastfeeding, yeah. you are, you have some more space, right? So like organically, this just like opens up like a little bit of space and, you're, and it gives you that space to really say like, Okay, and you, and you just like you 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 have now like the space to think about it, right? Like you don't you almost don't have it, and I, and everybody's different, right? Like I think every mother has a different setup too, like in terms of yeah. childcare, yeah. And again, like what priorities bandwidth. are bandwidth, bandwidth, like support, right? Like child support, like child like childcare, I think is like a big one. And their partners, um, like what 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 partners. their partners' schedules are like what their partner's temperament is like, yeah. what their child's temperament is like. Mm. And each child is so different. I'm going to give you a hack, though. <laughs> and it's self-pleasure. Oh, I believe that. 
That's a hack for most things. Huh? <laughs> if you want something in a jiffy. You got to do it yourself. <laughs> you got to do it yourself, of course. <laughs> like if you want to if you want to get get to the to the core of like your erotic creative zone, get to the core of your erotic mm -hmm. like creative zone. Do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you just want to advocate for that. Well, if you don't know who will, you know. That's, my, that's what my first <laughs> exactly. boyfriend told me. It's a good point. I mean, he made a great point. Yeah. Yeah. That's Thank you. Advice. Thank you Jenny, so Jenny, you much. have spoken to um, intimacy. You know, I, I believe it was in an article that you were talking about when you went away, but how intimacy does change between partners when kids come into play. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was like a very honest, amazing article. So, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think that intimacy is like subject to interpretation, right? So like intimacy isn't always sex. There's a lot of different variations of intimacy. I feel like intimately connected to Dina when I feel seen and heard. I feel like that's like intimate, right? Like that's an intimate moment. Um, and intimacy, obviously not sexual intimacy, but like there's an intimacy with being a mother and being with your children. So it's like almost like the shift, like it's like here's like your bucket of in intimacy and it's not just filled with only sex anymore. Now it's filled with like being a mother and, you know, deep conversations and growth and like all of these other things that are happening. Um, when it comes to actual like sex, like that is definitely impacted. <laughs> I mean, I only could speak for myself um, because there are a lot of new variables, of course, being exhausted is absolutely <laughs> one of them, um, for sure. But or recovering from birth. Oh, the, yeah, that. Yeah, and there's that. I mean, <laughs> that takes that could take yeah. longer for some than others. I was saying, like, I was one of the unicorns that, like, it, it, I I didn't hear at all really in in either of my um, unicorn. Unicorn, yeah. Unicorn. I mean, I couldn't breastfeed to save my fucking life. So like, everyone's got their yes, stuff. For sure. But like. You know, I didn't have much of a recovery, but there are there are women that it takes, you know, it takes a, a long time and for good reason. Actual human life has come out, a, generally speaking, in whole, no, you know, so <laughs> um, so there's that. But exhaustion is is mm -hmm. huge. And, you know, I, date nights, you guys do date nights? Yeah, we do now. We do. Um, that is like new um, starting this fall. We in, we. Um, integrated a like a Wednesday weekly date night and set it up that way with childcare so that we would have that ongoing, yeah. which is great. And obviously it's a good time to connect and know that it's just like whatever whatever we want to do, whatever we want to explore, we are connecting on that in the on that evening. Um the other thing I wanted to say was like also when it comes to like sex and intimacy, when you have really, really young kids <laughs> like again, like I do right now. Um, I think that a piece of it for me is knowing that there's like there's like a, a limited amount of time that my kids are gonna be this young. Yeah. So I don't really like to like go down the rabbit hole of like, oh my God, like we're not having enough sex. Like it's like my life is over. I'm not sexual. Like all of those, you know, like, you know, self-deprecating like rabbit hole, you know, way, like ways um, because and I don't want to like throw my relationship under the bus because like this is like the time that we're in, right? Like this is the time we're mm. in and it's like, it's okay. Like it does have a shelf life. Like my kids are getting older. Um, like it's happening. It's we, it's happening before my eyes. It's at rapid speed, as yeah. we talk about. Yeah. So, you know, not that sex is not important. Like I absolutely think it's important. So, like to speak to the listeners right now, like sex is obviously important. It's an integral part of like all of our relationships and our partnerships. If both people are, if it's important to both people involved, um, and I think it's it's adjusting. And, you know, working it through with your partner to find ways to incorporate it into your life where it doesn't feel for me like manufactured, like mm. scheduled or anything like that. Like mm. that, that doesn't work for me because that is the opposite of intimate to yeah, me. It's so really that's me. That I know that everybody's different. It's and I don't very wanna, like, cringe feeling to me. So like as a <laughs> non-mom, the schedule, the idea of looking at an eye calendar and being like, well, first of all, it feels so forced. I would be like, now I don't want to do it ever again because it's in there, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I understand that. Spontaneity is in, in inherently sexy. Yeah. 
yeah, it's exciting. It's it's all the things. But I but something that I love and have loved for so long following you. And I've, you know, here we are. I've I've mm-hmm. followed you all the way through, you know, <laughs> like we're friends, we're collaborators, you're here, you know. Yeah, it's awesome. Part of the reason is because I really identify with the experience of relishing this time, even in its yucky yeah. parts, <laughs> its darker shades, you know. I love your writing around around appreciating their littleness, yeah. you know, and then like how short that time is. And I do think like it, it, it may go over some of our audience's head and this is okay. Um, that priority shift mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. people change and mm-hmm. not everybody, Some for some people, uh, you know, their sex lives are so important to them. Um, and they don't want to give that up. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't bed share, let's say, with a child mm-hmm. because that's just not, that's just not for them. Mm-hmm. Totally cool. And I, I want to leave the option open for things to change and for time to take its course mm-hmm. and for relationships to take their course. Because... This is us playing the long game. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. Like life has so many different shades of love, mm-hmm. you know, so many different colors and textures. And um, and this baby love is is it's for such a short period. <laughs> it is. It it's, is. A, it's for such a short period. And there is something very tactile and sensual about it. And sometimes we feel touched out. Mm-hmm. Do you ever feel that way? I don't anymore, but absolutely when I was nursing. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because she was she was on you for yes. for so many hours of the yes. day. Yeah. So I, I think from I think I felt that more with Vita because mm. my first because I, I felt like it was like uncharted oh. territory with her and I just like didn't know how to navigate how to um like when to stop and everything felt like way more intense the first time. Mm-hmm. Um I felt much more in control with Bloom. So I didn't feel as touched out, but with Vita it got to a point where I was just like I wanted to stop, but I didn't want to stop. I wanted to stop. I didn't want to stop. This dance I did with myself for like months, and it was really tricky. And I actually have, I know a bunch of people that are going through that now. So I know I'm not alone in that experience. Yeah, especially when you're when you've extended the breastfeeding to the point where the child can ask for it. You know, mm-hmm. like it's a it's a totally different thing. At the, by the time my kids were done breastfeeding, they were four months old, mm-hmm. four and a half. You know, like all of a sudden something just disappeared. And a bottle came in its place. You know, it was a totally different thing than, mommy, I, I want a nurse. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is understandable, especially mm-hmm. the first time. I, I, I don't even know what the, what is that like, actually? What, do, you, do you just say no? You like. When you wean? Yeah, what is that like? Oh, my God. It was, well, with Bloom, it was like way easier because she was more distracted and she was the second. So her connection to nursing was strong. But like with Vita, it was like profound. It was yeah. like way more intense. Um, and and she's like more of thing. an intense person, right? From from like, yes, from what I see now. I mean, Bloom's still yes. too. So it's hard to tell. But 100%. Yeah, like Vita is way more pensive and um, way more intense. Um, so weaning happened with like, just like slowly dropping feeds and yeah, like really, if it's parents led mm. weaning as opposed to child led weaning, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's much harder. Well, it's harder on both parent and child, but it's really hard on the child when you're saying no and putting up that boundary. Um, it's like the individuation process. Oh, you have a question. Five minutes. Okay. It's the individuation process of like, you're two people. <laughs> Or two people, like the yeah. the one became two, mm-hmm. like, you know, to become one again. Yeah. And like, what does that mean to become one again? It, yeah. it, sometimes it means nursing, and sometimes it means going to a movie or getting a manicure. Yeah. You know, it's like a totally different experience. Somebody said to me when I was in the weaning process something that really like resonated with me. That I think, I mean, I know this is more mom curious, but something to kind of like note is that in the weaning process, when when mom feels all the guilt, right, for Mm -hmm. weaning and saying no and putting up the boundary, what you're actually teaching the child in that moment is to to have boundaries, right? That like, it's okay for mommy to have boundaries and to um, 
live in the discomfort, like being in, the, being in discomfort is not a bad thing. Boundaries are okay. Limitations are okay. Mommy can say no. Um, so if you look at it through that lens, it feels like almost like a lesson too. Mm. Like it doesn't feel so hard mm. or so challenging. I think with parenting, it's like really important to look at like the lesson, right? Mm-hmm. Like the like the learning, the learning moment from it and what you can how to reframe it so you, you could recognize what your child is actually gaining from the moment as opposed to what they're losing at the moment, even mm-hmm. when it feels hard. Because mm-hmm. yeah. it feels like that a lot, you know, like, it, you know, even saying like no, fun. boundaries, um, it's not teaching fun. moments, teaching them coping skills, like it's all really tricky stuff. All really important, though. Yeah. All really important to build their character and their moral compass. Yeah. I want to get into the, that with you also. We don't have much time. We can, I mean, we have a, we have five more minutes. We can get into it if you have something. I know you're really passionate about building their moral compass, mm-hmm. and I know you you have your own advocacy work. And I just would love to hear a little bit more about it. Just as we round out, you know what you what you hope for, you know for your kids and for yourself and for the for the world as you mm-hmm. are like building your your business but also yourself yeah I mean I think I'm raising two daughters two girls right in in 2021 it's a different world that I grew up in for Mm. sure um I was having a conversation with somebody this morning about um how do we integrate more diversity into our business models and our businesses and we were interestingly enough talking about like how if like somebody was asking us a question or in an interview, like how do we answer that if we feel like we're not actually like exercising um, or like advocating or doing the work we want to be doing. And something that came to my mind was I grew up in a different world, right? Like I grew up in a different time where we weren't having conversations at the dinner table about diversity and anti-racism and anti-Semitism. Um, those for me were not like the dinner table conversations, topics. And for, and for my kids, it is. It's, it's, it's part of what's happening in the world. So these conversations are ongoing and they're, they're, they're things that Vita and Bloom, well, Bloom's too, but like Vita <laughs> is um, starting, to, not starting to, it's, it's part of her, her, her regular, it's part of yeah. her, it's part of her normal. And we like to fill our library at home with books that talk about diversity, that prompt questions about diversity. We are very intentional about where, where we send her to school because social justice is a huge um, issue that is discussed and, and built into the curriculum. So it was, it's so, we're so mindful and so intentional about how we are raising them in, in the world to be inclusive and to understand diversity, obviously being from a same-sex family, you know, like that prompts lots of questions, right? Like recently Vita just, you know, really starting to understand like, how did I come into the world? Because up until like six months ago, she thought that like she was half me and half Dina, uh, right? So yeah. like that is like a, a conversation to unfold. And, and on some level she is. A hundred percent. Yeah. Scientifically, yeah. but she's not, yeah. right? So yeah. like, how, like how does that, how do you make sense of that to a six-year-old? And we're really not scared to have these difficult conversations in age-appropriate ways mm. with our girls and helping them to understand these things so that they could so that they could or not seamlessly but so that they can um navigate the world with more resilience and understanding and empathy and confidence and definitely confidence right because like you can't have empathy you, we can't love anyone else if we don't love ourselves if we don't yes. know ourselves mm-hmm. if we don't model knowing ourselves yes. for our children we have no <laughs> We have no hope for them. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, like, personal, my own personal growth work, right? Yeah. Is just as important as how I'm raising them. Yeah. Like, just staying, staying conscious and on top of that for myself. Yeah. Um, and accepting that I have a lot of work to do myself, right, through this process. I'm learning with them. And I'm okay with that, right? Because, like, again, like, I wasn't raised in the same world that they were raised in. So, there's a lot of unlearning that I have to do. There's a yeah. lot of, like, um, undoing that I have to do in order to you know, strengthen, strengthen my own lens and my own awareness and my own consciousness around um, advocacy work and diversity. I mean, I, 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 my parents are really spectacular people, but really we're not growth minded at all. I don't know that any of our parents were. Different generation. Yeah, different generation. Sure. It was like about making ends meet. 
I think, yeah. different generation. Yeah, I mean, they had other things to worry about. But I, I remember, like, turning to them and being like, I, even with technology, they just wouldn't get with it. I felt so <laughs> frustrated by it. I can't imagine, like, our children turning to us and, like, uh, you know, seeing us learning alongside them, uh, admitting when we don't know something and, you know, digging into it. Mm -hmm. That's so exciting to me. I'm sure we'll annoy them on other levels, but like, <laughs> I, well, we have to. I mean, that's like, yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. But at least we're not making the same mistakes mm -hmm. over again. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. It's okay to say you don't know, you know, it's like with yeah. your kids. It's, yeah. you know, or it's okay to say that like, you know, I, I, I need to work on that. You know, it's okay to to like admit those things. Yeah. Um, I think it creates more of like relatability between you and your kids too. Like we're human. Right. And, we if they, human. and if they have questions and if they have shortcomings, like then they won't be so afraid to tell us, right? Mm -hmm. Then we can like get through it together yeah. as long as like we're not making this like experience of being human like a taboo thing. <laughs> We just don't know. Well, I think that's what well, happens. It. Like what you're saying is like you do inevitably create a more fearful child when you aren't open about your own questions or struggles or anything. I never saw my mom. My mom is very tough and like not taking any shit. And like forever I just thought she like was never scared or like never. Oh. And it wasn't until I was like probably in my 20s that I was like, oh this is an act for me. This yeah. is not really – which like, I mean, she is tough. Don't get me wrong. But like, you can't be every second all the time, never scared of anything, no matter what it is. And like, I am much more outwardly like anxious or fearful, you know, than she is. And I think that that stems from like, I didn't even think it was okay to feel that way or to feel scared. So I think giving kids like the room to be like, I don't, I don't know, you know. Mm -hmm it's okay to feel like you don't know or like you're scared or whatever, you know, is a beautiful gift. Yeah. I like to share stories with Vita when she's like having tricky feelings about something. Like I'll say to her, like either it's a story from like when I was her age, like I'll just be like, you know, when I was your age, like such and such happened. Or I could even say she has a really hard time with threes, like groups of three. I don't know if I told you this. No. Um, she likes like one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. That makes focused sense. attention on her um so that's brought up a lot in the past few months and like from from the get-go when we started talking about this I said like well sometimes I have trouble with threes too you know if especially if I want to spend one-on-one -on -one time with you know just sort of like create the like that like what you're feeling is valid like mm. it's like everything you feel is is okay and valid what you do with those feelings and how we cope with those feelings and how you react to those feelings, that's the work, right? Yeah. That's the learning, right? Like how do we react to them? Like being inclusive is important and, but being one-on-one -on -one with somebody and wanting that is okay too. Yeah. And there's room for all of it. Yeah. Um, I just think it's how we navigate um, and how we react to those things is what's important. Yeah. I just love you so much. <laughs> you too. I'm so glad that we finally like met in person. Mm -hmm. That you just the beginning changed my fucking life and dance on on its way. On its ongoing. And ongoing. that you're here today. I love your husband too. Thanks. He's a great guy. He's so sweet. Um, where do we find you? So, YourSoulStyle.com is my website, which is actually being rebuilt and will be relaunched um, within the next, like, two weeks. So I'm mm -hmm. really excited about that. Beautiful. I've been working on this for a long time, and it's finally all happening. So, so. by the time this is out, that will be. So oh, if you amazing. Wanna, yes. Okay, so I don't need to say that. You, well, you could say it again. You can say it again. Okay. Yeah. So, you can find me at YourSoulStyle.com um, or at Instagram at your soul style is my handle those are the two places to find me amazing yeah. Thank or you, you can email me oh yeah Wait, what's the email <laughs> it's uh my email is jenny at your soul .com. say hi say what's up let's connect thank you for more episodes make sure to follow mom curious available on all podcast platforms thanks <laughs> <laughs>